This tape series is being produced by analytical research laboratories to introduce a new system of nutritional science. The subject of the first tape is an introduction to the status in nutrition today. This is followed by an overview of the methods that are being developed to facilitate and correct our nutritional deficiencies, with a particular emphasis on hair analysis. The final part of the tape is a brief introduction to the science of mineral balancing. Some of what I'm going to say concerning nutrition in general and about our food supply may be rather shocking and disturbing, but it is nevertheless the truth. It is good to be acquainted with it and to know this is what we are dealing with. Everything that I'm going to say is backed up by a multitude of scientific publications. I'll be referring to some of these on this tape. The idea behind understanding the situation in nutrition today is not to become paranoid, but we do need to understand what is going on. So let's begin by looking at the status of nutrition today. We have today a declining state of nutrition in the general public due to many factors. The nutritional content of our food has deteriorated, deteriorated to quite a severe degree, even though it has happened so subtly over the last 50 years that it has not been recognized to the extent that it needs to be. It is just beginning to be recognized. People are waking up little by little. Let's begin by taking a look at agriculture. In the last 50 years, there has been extensive development and use of chemical fertilizers. The major ingredients found in the most commonly used fertilizers are nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Sometimes lime is added. Important as the above minerals are for soil productivity, other important minerals, such as the trace minerals zinc, chromium, manganese, molybdenum, cobalt, and a few others, have been omitted. The end result of using nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus year after year is a soil depleted in trace minerals, a depleted and imbalanced soil which is incapable of supporting life. In the past, manganese, zinc, chromium, and the others were present in the manure used as fertilizer, but with the farming methods we have today, these elements are not put back. Little by little, the soil has become depleted. As a consequence, the food produced from the soil is depleted of these elements. The problem has reached quite severe proportion. The protein content of our wheat, for example, has diminished from approximately 15% to approximately 7%. Dr. Carl Pfeiffer mentions in his book, Mental and Elemental Nutrients, that manganese depletion is very widespread and that you can't tell from the foliage because the plant can look to be in excellent health, but nevertheless, manganese is almost non-existent. Dr. Max Gerson, who is a pioneer in the field of nutritional therapy, found in 1948 that he had to switch to organically grown food because the nutritional content of the food had diminished so much that his nutritional cancer therapy was no longer effective. When he switched over to food grown on mineralized soil by an organic method, the therapy began to be effective again. He devotes an entire chapter to this fact in his book called A Cancer Therapy, Results of 50 Cases. We are now 35 years past the time that that book was published. We are just beginning to understand the consequences of this wholesale depletion of nutrients in our soil. It is really a form of soil mining where you remove nutrients and just keep removing them, never adding them back. This method of farming is unsustainable, but yet it is what we are doing uh, today. There are other factors to complicate this situation. In the last 40 years, there's been a widespread and increasingly heavy use of pesticides. The pesticides, first of all, poison the vital microorganisms in the soil. These microorganisms are needed to enhance the absorption of nutrients by the plants. So right away, we have nutritional depletion in the plants. Then, the pesticides are toxic to animals, toxic to plants, toxic to human beings. Pesticides deplete nutrients within our bodies because we use up nutrients in an attempt to counteract the toxic effects of these chemicals. Pesticides are among the deadliest chemicals known to man. As little as one drop of the more toxic ones will kill as many as 1,200 people. 
For example, Agent Orange is a defoliant and a pesticide. Its composition is chemically very close to nerve gas. I read one day that they don't have to worry about not having enough nerve gas because we have plenty of defoliants around that are very similar in structure. Extremely, extremely poisonous chemicals, yet they are being used by the ton each year. These do tremendous damage to the soil. The soil is similar to our external metabolism. When the soil becomes depleted, so too is the nutrient value of the food, even though it may look wonderful. Ever-increasing amounts of pesticides have been needed. The reason is that healthy plants resist disease and insect attack in exactly the same way that healthy people resist illness. When the plants are sick from depletion of vital macro and trace nutrients, there develops the need to develop and employ pesticides to kill off the pests that would otherwise destroy the unhealthy crop. A third factor contributing to the decline in our health is the extensive use of hybrid crops. Hybrids are almost universal today. The problem is that hybrids are bred for many qualities, including vigor, but rarely for nutritional quality. Apple hybrids today are developed for redness. Tomato hybrids are developed so that a picking machine can pick them without damaging them. Many crops are bred for high yield in exchange for nutrient content. These hybrids are not developed for nutritional quality and the nutritional qualities of the produce has suffered from hybridization. What we have is an abundant supply of nutritionally low quality food. We would all be in healthier condition if we ate moderate amounts of nutritional high quality food rather than never really satisfying our body's needs as we eat large amounts of food deficient in protein, vital minerals, and vitamins. So today we are exclu exclusively using these high-yield strains and high-yield methods. And the primary focus is on quantity, not quality. Everything I'm talking about here, by the way, is thoroughly documented. If you're interested, I suggest a magazine called Acres USA, which publishes technical articles every month concerning soil analysis, food analysis, and in-depth articles on pesticides and other agriculturally related topics. Soil erosion and other unwise farming practices have also contributed to the depletion of nutrients. There is an official line, of course, by the USDA that says that all this is not true, that the food we eat is just as good as it ever was, and that there is no difference between the food grown on soil fertilized with compost and chemically fertilized soil, and so forth. Experiments that have been conducted by the USDA, however, are faulty. One of the reasons that they are faulty is that in order to build up a soil, it takes years, just as it takes years to build up a body nutritionally. So if you conduct an agricultural experiment on two fields without first spending five years or so to develop a truly organic, mineralized soil, you don't get a true difference, and you won't really understand what's going on. There is an excellent book called The Soil and Health by Sir Albert Howard, which documents the true experiments in agriculture. It's a rather shocking situation. I would say it's analogous to the way x-rays used to be used in medicine. Few individuals, if any, realize the harm caused by giving x-rays and fluoroscope exams for almost everything about 30 and 40 years ago. The same lack of insight holds true in agriculture today. For obvious, yet seemingly, the obvious yet seemingly unexpected result is extreme nutritional depletion of our food supply. One of the reasons there is so much interest in nutrition today, subliminally, is this lack of nutrition in our food. In other words, people may not realize why, but they do know intuitively that vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients are helping them with many of their health problems. Well, the reason they're helping today so much is because their bodies are severely malnourished. Dr. Weston Price was a dentist who traveled around the world. He wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, published in 1938. He studied primitive tribes and found that many of the so-called 
primitive people were getting four times the amount of nutrients which have been established as our minimum daily requirements. Americans hardly get one time the minimum daily requirement of several nutrients. Dr. Price found that if you get one time the minimum daily requirement, it will keep you alive and managing. But to be healthy is another story, and that requires about four times the minimum daily requirement. In addition to the previously discussed factors in agriculture, we today have nutritional depletion due to transport and storage of our food. It used to be that food was locally grown on small farms. Today that's no longer true. A large percentage of our food comes from Florida, California, and Mexico, from gigantic farms. The food may spend a week in a truck or warehouse before it arrives at the marketplace. Certain nutrients decline rapidly when they are stored. For example, vitamin C content in green vegetables decreases by about half within hours of being picked. Also, many fruits are picked before they're fully ripe and at maximum nutritional value so that they have not spoiled by the time they arrive at your dinner table. Another factor contributing to nutritional depletion today is food processing. Consider the following. Did you know that white flour in the United States at one time was seized by the FDA as unfit to eat? The case went to the Supreme Court. White flour was considered an adulterated food because of the use of a bleaching process which is still being used today. The flour companies, needless to say, managed to get around the Supreme Court decision. This is described in a book by Dr. Harvey Wiley, the first head of the FDA. The name of the book is The History of the Crime Against the Food Law. Same holds true of Coca-Cola. It was also banned in the United States, and the case went to the Supreme Court, and the verdict was overturned. These so-called foods contain several harmful substances and little, if any, nutritional value. In about 1945, white rice was fed to pigeons. The pigeons curled up with polyneuritis very rapidly from a lack of B vitamins, whereas the natural brown rice was able to supply the B vitamins. As a result, uh, the government forced the uh, companies to put back a few essential nutrients that they knew about, B1, B2, B3, and iron. The end result is what we refer to today as enriched bread. Some so-called authorities claim that this enriched bread is every bit as good as the bread made from whole wheat flour. In the refining process, however, about 40 nutrients are removed that we know about, and probably many more that we have not yet discovered. Then the companies enrich the flour with about four nutrients. This is analogous to someone robbing you of $100 and then enriching you with $4. The same wholesale removal of nutrients also holds true with white sugar. All the nutrients in the sugar cane goes into the molasses, which is the other part of the processing of sugar, and molasses uh, is, is removed and fed to the cows, I might add. All the better for the cows, all the worse for us. Frozen vegetables today are sprayed with EDTA to retain their color. EDTA is a chelating agent which leaches out 10 to 20 percent of the vegetable's mineral content. We also have the canning of foods. The foods are overcooked often, and then chemical substances are added, and then there is loss of nutrients during the time they are stored on the shelf. So it is that processing and the widespread use of processed foods has a devastating effect on quality. It's really a crime what goes on. The grocery stores appreciate processed food because shelf life is increased. No one needs to worry about rats eating white flour. They intuitively know better. White flour won't spoil the way whole wheat flour does. Food additives is another problem. When we eat a lot of food additives, no one really knows as yet the true extent of their serious effects on health. What is known is that the FDA tested a number of them way back in 1920, including saccharin, sodium benzoate, and a number of others. Every single one of them was found to be harmful to human health. These experiments were conducted on people. They were volunteers in the Department of Agriculture. 
The name of the group was called the Poison Squad, and they were employees. They volunteered to ingest small amounts of these substances over a period of time. These experiments were very carefully controlled. All the individual had to eat all their meals and give all their urine and feces for analysis. Every one of the additives, many of which are still used today, had to be discontinued because the volunteers became ill. This is also detailed in the book, The History of the Crime Against the Food Law. To make matters worse, there are now over 3,000 food additives being used in our foods. For the most part, their interactions with other chemicals is largely unknown. It's one thing when you eat one or two additives, but what if you're eating 10 or 12? This is another factor important in nutrition today. One of the conclusions from all this that we are forced to reach is that nutritional knowledge, number one, is very important today. It is also the reason why books written about nutrition that were written 30 years ago do not apply today anymore. In this regard, natural healing books, even those of uh, doctors Herbert Shelton, Jethro Kloss, Arnold Errett, are not up to date. There is a vital need to go beyond the nutritional advice of these early pioneers of nutrition because the situation today is much worse. It was much worse when Max Gerson wrote his book in 1958 and we're now uh, 30 years just about past there. Today we are seeing an entirely different type of burnout. Dr. Paul Eck has said that within the 10 years he has been doing hair analysis work, he has watched nutrient values drop precipitously on the hair charts. That's how quickly our health as a population is deteriorating today. Now, as though the food factors are not enough, there are a couple of other factors. Today there is widespread use of medical prescription remedies and over-the-counter remedies. Many people fail to realize that these medications while they may do some good, they deplete numer numerous essential food nutrients. Some of them do a fantastic job of depleting nutrients. For example, most of the cancer chemotherapy side effects are due to depletion of vital nutrients. That idea may sound incredible, but I know it's true because I put people on nutrition programs who are on cancer chemotherapy, and all the side effects of the treatment eventually went away. That is, they were no longer tired, their hair ceased to fall out, joint pain ceased. They were able to continue the treatment, and yet um, they did not have side effects. Nothing else was changed. The side effects were caused by nutritional depletion. A great many people, especially the elderly, are taking four or more different medications. These medications cause havoc with their nutritional status. A special hazard for women are birth control pills and copper intrauterine devices. According to statistics, several million women are currently taking birth control pills. Another factor is stress. We know with absolute certainty that stress of all kinds depletes nutrients in the body. Air pollution, water pollution, the sensory overload of living in our cities, driving in the city, all of these things adversely affect our nutritional status. Zinc reserves may become severely depleted within minutes of encountering a stress. They are giving zinc in burn centers today because the doctors realize that people under great stress become tremendously zinc depleted. Fifty years ago, the pace of life was slower. The air and the water were generally cleaner. We didn't have the multitude or the severity of stress that afflict us today. There were different stresses, but the rapidity of, of change today and of life uh, is unparalleled. These are some of the reasons why nutritional science is becoming more important and will become even more important. Many of the, many of the issues that I'm discussing are not being addressed nearly seriously enough, so the situation is going to continue to worsen before it gets better. The medical profession has not yet tuned into the problem for any number of reasons. One is that as a group, 
they became infatuated with miracle drugs starting about 40 years ago when sulfa and penicillin was first introduced to combat infections. It was thought that there could be a magic pill. Before that, if you read very old medical books from about the turn of the century, there was a great deal more interest in nutrition. Then suddenly nutrition went out of fashion. The medicine we have with us today is a medicine based on the predominant problems 30 and 40 years ago, which were the infectious diseases. The medical profession has done well in combating the infectious diseases with antibiotics. However, today even antibiotics are losing their effectiveness from overuse and because you must have a sufficiently um, well-nourished body in order to even use the medicine. A major problem is that this depletion of the vital elements is a relatively new phenomenon. The medical profession has not caught up with this phenomenon. And as a result, we are now dealing with this problem. Medical doctors have not been trained in recognizing nutritional deficiencies. One reason why nutrition has been neglected is that up to the relatively recent time, it has not been possible to precisely measure nutritional deficiencies. With the discovery of atomic absorption spectrometry, which is used to analyze soil as well as plants and can analyze human tissue for their trace element content, all of this changed. An accurate method of determining nutritional deficiencies through examining hair or other body tissue came into being and is referred to as hair analysis. Before we discuss hair analysis, Let's begin by looking at what is being done in the area of nutrition to correct the problem. The first step is to eat natural foods. This is one level of nutritional correction. It is a start and certainly is an important basis for health. In many cases, it is very difficult to accomplish anything if you continue to insist on eating junk foods, chemical additives, and so forth. However, we, will, we must be aware that many people will not get well and will not have optimum health by just eating natural foods. The reason for this is that many complex biochemical changes occur when a person becomes nutritionally depleted. It is well known that nature abhors a vacuum. When you become deficient in, let us say, zinc, you begin to accumulate other elements, such as cadmium, this replaces zinc and becomes attached to the binding sites previously occupied by zinc. It doesn't do as good a job. It's like a replacement part on a car that's not quite as good as the original, but it does work to some extent and allows certain enzymes to function 60 or 70 percent. Much of what has happened to cause a deterioration of our health is due to the replacement by substitute toxic metals at binding sites where essential minerals should be present. The amount of zinc contained in the natural foods we eat daily is not sufficient to displace and eliminate the cadmium in our body. As a result, a return to optimum health becomes impossible just from eating natural food. Today a diet, a good diet, is the beginning, but it is rarely enough. I used to believe that eating good food was enough to get well and it never worked, and we've learned otherwise. There is yet another reason why good natural diet alone will not suffice. An important concept which we will continue to refer to in later tapes is that of biochemical individuality. The concept of this individuality is based on the fact that some people require more of certain nutrients than they need of others. One food may be significantly essential for someone, yet that same food may be detrimental for another. Just eating good quality food, which is a good start, is not adequate because everyone is different. Some people, for various reasons, require increased amounts of dairy products. Some people don't do well on dairy products. To ensure optimum health, we need to be more specific in our approach than simply eating a good diet. A second approach that is used, which is also nonspecific, 
is to take a multivitamin. Because of our food is deficient in many nutrients, zinc, iron, manganese, and vitamins as well, some individuals could undoubtedly benefit from the use of a good quality multivitamin mineral supplement. However, the problem associated with a multivitamin vitamin are many. First, there are brands which do not contain what they claim to contain or contain harmful fillers, binders, colors, flavors. These can actually cause reactions and make a person worse. More importantly, they contain nutrients, both vitamins and minerals, that your particular chemistry doesn't need. For example, many multivitamin mineral supplements contain what may seem to be a reasonable amount of the mineral copper, yet that amount of copper may be toxic to your particular chemistry. In such a case, taking such a multivitamin supplement could actually make you feel worse or contribute somewhere in time to the genesis of future problems. However, the use of a multivitamin is an option. Some products such as sea kelp, green mana, spirulina, bee pollen, and others are beneficial inasmuch as they do contain certain essential trace elements that are missing from our food. However, taking a multivitamin mineral supplement is a general approach and is not a specific and precise approach to nutrition. A more tailored approach to determine what nutrients are needed or not needed is to employ a specific analytical method. And there are many of these available for determining nutritional needs. You have probably heard of many of them, from kinesiology, iridology, and macrobiotics, to radionics, astrology, and others. All of these methods have some value, and I don't mean to degrade any of them. I've employed several of these methods at one time or another. In reality, however, my experience is that none of these come close to offering what a properly designed hair analysis program can offer. At this point, I want to say that in the holistic field, different methods work for different people. For example, taking a certain herbal combination may be just the thing for one person, and he may derive a great state of health from it that he's been seeking for years. But for rebuilding body chemistry by systematic and precise means, general means that tend to work for most people, I haven't found anything equal to a properly designed hair analysis program. Other methods of nutritional assessment, such as computer questionnaires, blood tests, and urine tests, are all have some intrinsic value. But I would like to focus for the rest of this tape on hair analysis and how, may we, how we may use this valuable tool to enhance health through specifically applied nutrition. The rest of this tape is dedicated to the subject of hair analysis and an introduction to the principles of the science of mineral balancing. We will answer on this tape only some very basic questions that are asked about hair analysis. Another tape is devoted entirely to an in-depth study of this subject. Uh, to we'll begin by answering some questions that are asked about hair analysis. The first question often asked is, how is it even possible to obtain a mineral reading from a sample of hair? The answer is that hair is an actively growing tissue. It is metabolically active. Minerals are laid down in the hair as the hair grows out. These minerals are fixed into the hair tissue. The minerals play a critical, vital role. They are like the spark plugs of the body. They become a constituent of what is called metalloenzymes. These enzymes relate to the various intracellular functions in every tissue of the body. A hair sample is taken to a laboratory where it is dissolved with acid and then, and then burned at 2,000 to 5,000 degrees centigrade in an ins instrument called an atomic absorption spectrophotometer. There are other instruments that may be used, such as an induction-coupled pl plasma torch and X-ray spectrophotometer. In the burning, each mineral gives off a spectrographic pattern. This pattern is picked up by sensors within the instrument and 
these readings are translated into numbers in milligrams per cent. Some laboratories read it in parts per million. Milligram per cent is 10 times parts per million. It's a very delicate, high technology process. These are computer controlled instruments that actually go out of date every three years or so because of advances in technology. Yet if they are calibrated properly, they give a very precise reading of the mineral content of the hair. What we are getting in hair analysis is an intracellular mineral biopsy. The cells and the interstitial spaces are being uh, biopsied. Hair is used because it is convenient, painless, grows quickly, and fairly evenly. The second most commonly asked question is, are the mineral readings consistent and reliable? The answer to this question is yes, if the test is properly performed and properly interpreted. That qualification is very important because hair analysis is a very precise technique. It has to be performed correctly. The hair must be cut correctly and it must be properly analyzed. It is important to know your laboratory. You can send in two identical samples and a comparison of the two tests should be consistent at the same lab. You can check the laboratory using a person who is not on a nutritional corrective program. Send in the hair sample, wait a few months and send another sample. The results should be very much the same. There is some variation over a period of time, even a couple months, but in general the mineral readouts should be consistent and reliable. People who say that hair analysis is not consistent and reliable are either using laboratories that don't know what they're doing or they are not cutting the hair samples consistently the same way and not mixing them correctly or they have in some way rigged the sample so that the test cannot be duplicated. We find the tests are reliable within about 3% accuracy when it is done properly. Another question is, are the readings significant? Assuming they're reliable, what do they indicate? I used many hair analysis laboratories. I went through five or six because I was not getting very good results uh, on nutrition program. I arrived that the readings were not significant. They had to be telling us something, but as far as extracting any real information, I became very confused. When I began to use analytical research laboratory, and started understanding the principles of the oxidation type, the stages of stress, and the principles of interpretation that we're going to describe on these tapes, it began to fall into place. What I've concluded is that 95% of the hair analysis laboratories may not understand fully what these readings are telling us, but in fact they are very significant. The minerals provide us with information as to our rate of metabolism, how our endocrine glands are functioning, how the organs are functioning. We can look at mineral patterns and predict trends toward various pathologies. We're provided with information as to nutritional deficiencies and toxic metal poisoning. We can determine the stage of stress the body is in. We can determine emotional and mental patterns and tendencies. All in all, hair analysis is an extremely cost-effective test in terms of the amount of information derived from it, but only when we understand how to do it correctly, both in taking the sample analyzing it, and interpreting the results. Next question is, why have doctors sent out identical samples to two different laboratories and received different results? There are several reasons. First of all, we will assume that they cut the hair correctly, and then they mix the sample homogeneously together so as to attain two uniform samples. The first variation has to do with washing procedures. Unfortunately, hair analysis labs have not standardized their washing procedure, and this makes a huge difference in the readings which are obtained. Many of the elements, particularly sodium, potassium, calcium, iron, and manganese, are water-soluble. And if you leave chopped up hair in a water soak, these minerals will leach out into the water. Some labs don't use a pre-wash, some use a mechanical wash, some use acetone, some use Trident X detergent, some use a three-minute wash, some use a 10-minute wash. One lab that I called recently uses 11 washes. So this makes a big difference, makes a huge difference. You can't assume, because the numbers look similar, 
on a hair test that it that it means the same thing if it's from two different laboratories. You must know your lab. About 90% of the doctors don't know their laboratory. They don't know how or even if the hair is washed. The type of instrumentation being used is a second factor of great importance. It is important to know what instrument your laboratory is using because some instrumentation is more sensitive than others for measuring the same element. These are some of the reasons why you get different readings from different laboratories. Next question that is asked is, why are the normal values different from different laboratories? The answer is, to a great extent, related to the previous question. If you use a different washing technique, you will get different values, and the normals must, of necessity, be different. The laboratories base their normals upon the kind of results that they get with their protocol. There's another source of variation of normals, and this has to do with where the established normals come from. Some laboratories use the average American, quote, average healthy Americans. Well, average Americans aren't all that healthy, as we talked about on the first side of this tape. As a result, the values they obtain will not be reflections of optimum health. Some use labs do use healthy athletes or other groups for establishing normals. Analytical research laboratories did use healthy athletes. So the normal values differ from lab to lab for numerous reasons. The washing procedures and the instrumentation are used affect the normals that each lab arrives at. Uh, however, there are no established normals at this time, and therefore there will be some variation. Another question that arises is, are there scientific studies to support hair analysis? Well, this technique has been around for about 30 years. The methodology has been used for testing minerals in the soil, and it's been used in veterinary medicine for testing mineral nutriture of animals and livestock. There is an enormous amount of literature available. Anyone who says that there isn't good scientific studies either has their eyes closed or they don't want to acknowledge it. For example, I have in front of me abstracts on hair analysis that a laboratory sent to me. There are about 20 on each side of the paper here, and there are 20 pages on the uh, list of abstracts. That amounts to about 400 references. If you want references, you can look at Carl Pfeiffer's book, Mental and Elemental Nutrients, for example, or you can send away to a laboratory, and they will send you a list, a bibliography, or abstracts. There is an abundance of literature on each element. These abstracts prove very clearly that hair analysis is a valid tool. Some of the journals that are here in my abstracts include the Journal of the American Medical Association, the Journal of Environmental Health, the Archives of Internal Medicine. In other words, reputable journals. They print articles showing that tissue mineral analysis is a valid tool for assessing mineral nutrition. A great percentage of the research material relating to hair analysis has evolved itself from research related to toxic metals. This is where the emphasis has been. And the use of toxic metal screening is accepted in the more uh, up-to-date medical centers. Another question is, how do the hair readings relate to blood and urine tests? Some literature says you must do a blood test to confirm a hair test. And that if you don't do a blood test, you're being irresponsible. Is this true? The answer is it's not true. First of all, a blood test cannot confirm a hair test. A hair test is a tissue test. A blood test is a reading of extracellular fluid. The blood represents a different compartment of the body. The blood is like the highway, your body's mode of transportation. When you get a calcium reading in the blood, that calcium might be going from the intestine into the bone, or from the bone into the tissue, or from the tissue into the urine. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going to. Blood analysis provides a different type of reading completely. You cannot correlate mineral readings in the hair with a mineral reading in the blood, unless you understand exactly the metabolism behind those readings. 
This is not to say that there's not usefulness, of course, for blood tests, urine tests, and other correlating tests. And they may be used together. But you don't have to do them together. You cannot confirm a hair test with a blood test reading. That thought is ridiculous. From my experience working in the medical field and now working in the hair analysis field, I find that many times the hair test, if you want to do just one test, is a much more useful screening tool. Certainly for nutritional correction, this is the case. Blood tests are useful for many other determinations, such as the t to detect anemia or cholesterol readings. This is fine, and blood tests are excellent for this. However, for nutritional correction, a hair analysis is much more useful than blood and urine testing. You can't tell what's going to be on a hair test from a blood test, and you can't tell what's going to be revealed on a blood test from a hair test, necessarily. There are different kinds of tests. There is some correlation if you understand the biochemistry, but that is all. For example, a slow oxidizer often has a high blood cholesterol level and a low blood glucose level. This comes from understanding the chemistry of slow oxidation. Slow oxidizers have trouble releasing glucose, and they tend not to use cholesterol properly. But they, these, this understanding does not come from directly correlating readings. It comes from understanding the chemistry behind the readings. Another common question that is asked is, do the hair readings indicate the total body load of a mineral? There was an article not too long ago in the New York Times by Jane Brody, the nutrition uh, correspondent, that hair analysis isn't valid because it doesn't show the total body load of a mineral. Well, no one ever said it did. Clearly, it doesn't. A hair test only tells you what is within the cells of the hair. Norms have been found for these values, and abnormal variances have been correlated with certain dysfunctional metabolic trends. Hair analysis does not give you the total body load of a mineral. All you are getting is a hair tissue mineral reading. Another co question commonly asked is, what about contamination of the hair by hair products, dust, and other things? There are those who claim that hair analysis is invalid because of the contamination of the hair. Well, you would think so. I used to think so. I used to think, gee, isn't this going to affect the test? Surprisingly enough, it doesn't. Analytical research laboratories had its employees ride in on their bicycles when it was 110 degrees in Phoenix, and they were dripping with sweat. They took a hair sample and then had them shower, wash their hair and take another sample. And the results just didn't vary that much. The hair is not that porous. This is one of the keys. However, there are certain products that do affect medical, mineral readings, and it's important to know about them. Grecian formula hair dye, for example, is high in lead. Head and shoulders anti-dandruff shampoo is high in zinc. Selsun blue shampoo is high in selenium. Swimming in pools can raise uh, copper levels. However, we find that most people wash their hair and that the usual shampooing of the hair removes the direct environmental and dust type of contamination. And most of the people uh, who we deal with are in a fairly good state of hygiene. Permanent waves do affect the mineral readings, and as a result, after a, a permanent wave treatment, uh, the hair should be washed about five times before submitting a hair for testing. The ma majority of hair colorings, sprays, shampoos do not contain significant amounts of mineral and do not affect the mineral readings in a significant way. Another question that arises is, do all the laboratories interpret the hair test the same way? The answer is clearly no. And the last part of this tape is going to deal with mineral balancing science as compared to other methods of interpretation. My experience is that every lab in, uh, interprets the hair analysis differently. I've not found any two labs that do it the same. 
Every lab has their resident nutritional consultant or expert who interprets the test and who sends you back a program that tells you what minerals and vitamins are recommended. And that for the same pattern, each lab has a different uh, interpretation. It's very confusing. It's enough to drive anyone half crazy unless you persist or are fortunate enough to find a lab that is really doing good work. The reason this tape series is being made is because labs uh, interpret results differently and because there's a need to clarify the principles of interpretation and to make this into a science and not guesswork. Another question asked is, how can you even design a nutrition program that has vitamins in it when we are only testing minerals? Articles have appeared in the press claiming that hair analysis is fraudulent because vitamins are recommended when we're not even testing for vitamins. The answer is that we don't recommend nutrients based on the mineral values alone. The mineral values are raw data. With those numbers, we then construct a picture of the body chemistry. That picture might read something like this. We might say the thyroid gland is overactive due to the presence of a toxic metal, which is having a stimulatory effect. Or the kidneys are under strain, and the enzyme systems that require manganese are defective in their function because there is a deficiency of manganese. So forth and so on. We might say the digestive enzymes are not being secreted in proper quantity because there is a lack of zinc, which is required for their formation. As a result, protein metabolism is impaired. You see, those are the kinds of pictures we get from the hair analysis. We're not just saying, you have a low zinc, take zinc. That is referred to as replacement therapy, which is a less than effective concept and methodology. And when we know a picture of the chemistry, we can then know that certain vitamins, as well as minerals, can be of help to that person. To understand the fallacy of replacement therapy is very important, and we'll come back to this on a later tape. Many of the studies that are used to disprove hair analysis um, are based on the replacement therapy concept. For example, there's one that is often quoted by um, uh, traditional authorities from the University of Zimbabwe, in which they fed rats zinc, and they did hair tests before and after. They found that the zinc levels did not rise, so they decided that hair testing was not significant as a testing method. Well, the reason this study didn't work is because you can't do it that way. It's necessary to see the entire metabolic picture. The zinc reading upon feeding zinc may actually go lower. This does not mean that hair analysis doesn't work. What it means is, is that the interaction of giving zinc with the rat's metabolism at that time did not result in deposition of zinc in the tissue. The rat may have rejected the zinc, and as I say, in some people, in some metabolisms, giving zinc can actually lower the tissue zinc level. So, in fact, it is necessary to construct an entire picture of the chemistry and to interpret the test properly, and only then can we recommend legitimately minerals, vitamins, and foods. Otherwise, uh, the replacement theory is a, is a false theory. It's, a, it's not a holistic approach and it, um, it's a single element approach, and it doesn't work. Finally, the question is often asked, what are the trends that are printed out on hair analysis programs? It will say something like, you have a tendency to adrenal exhaustion, arthritis, and allergies, and the person may not presently have any of these symptoms. Some will discount the analysis on this basis. Well, the source of those trends is that by studying thousands of hair tests, correlations between mineral patterns and trends towards certain diseases are now well established. Significant correlations have been found between mineral patterns and illness. If your patient exhibits uh, the pattern for a short period of time, the illness may not have surfaced or manifested. 
if the pattern has existed for an extended period of time, it has become chronic, for example, there's an increased probability that the dysfunction will manifest. However, a trend is only a trend, and it is not a diagnosis, and there's no way to tell how long that trend has existed. Therefore, on many people, the trends will show a disease, but that disease will not be present. Ongoing research proves out these trends. They come up time and time again as we work with this tool. They are not diagnostic. diagnostic. Uh, hair analysis is a screening tool, but the trends say that, for example, if you have a high cadmium, there's a good chance that you can have arthritic symptoms or hardening of the arteries. High cadmium is associated with hardening of the arteries, high blood pressure, etc. So it is a trend, and that is all it is. It's an indicator of possibilities. It is really very nice because hair analysis is a predictive tool and therefore preventive. If you note a trend, you can head off that trend years before the person manifests the illness. These are some of the basic questions that are asked about hair analysis. The remainder of this tape will be a discussion of certain principles, which are the key principles to the mineral balancing science. Uh, Dr. Pollack has extracted several principles from the work of other 20th century scientists and synthesized them into a novel nutritional approach. The first principle is a very obvious one, uh, but one that is not well known, called teleology. It is the principle that nature has purpose and ends. And we keep this in mind at all times, that there are goals of our organism. It must survive. It must produce energy. And it tries to keep itself in balance, in health, at all times. And this is the concept of teleology, or goals, in nature. A second principle, homeostasis. This is the idea that an organism maintains itself, it, it, it accomplishes its purpose, or its teleology, by maintaining a dynamic equilibrium, or a, a balance in the face of stress. It maintains many unstable parts in a balance in the face of internal and external stresses. This is a very important concept because as we work to correct the chemistry, we will work with homeostatic states and we will restore homeostasis and we will move the organism from less desirable homeostatic states to more desirable homeostatic states. It's very, very basic and it's very different from a symptomatic approach. Because a person may feel worse as they move toward a better homeostatic state, but yet they're getting better. And, and eventually they will balance off in the new state. A third principle are the stages of stress, which was a concept originated by Dr. Hans Selye. This is the idea that the organism responds in a non-specific way to stress in predetermined manners, and that these predetermined manners can be measured. These are called the alarm, resistance, and exhaustion states. By knowing the stage of stress that an organism is in, we enhance our knowledge tremendously of the chemistry that is taking place in that body. And by knowing the chemistry, we can then move it to a more desirable stage. Another important principle is that of the oxidation types, which was uh, the work of Dr. George Watson. This concept states that each stage of stress is characterized by a certain biochemical pattern. Dr. Watson didn't realize that the, the, his types, his oxidation types, re, uh, were related to the stages of stress. This was one of the syntheses by Dr. Paul Eck. But by knowing the pattern, that the person is functioning in, we can become more cognizant concerning the intricate aspects of biochemistry. The patterns are called the oxidation types. Another important principle is the concept of adaptation. 
It states that our bodies modify themselves or adapt to stress by making certain subtle changes in homeostasis. It, thousands of uh, subtle modifications take place in order to survive. And that each adaptation is a lower energy state and that each, each adaptation requires energy. Therefore, as the body is forced to adapt more and more, it is forced to expend more and more energy to achieve and maintain itself. Thus, less energy is available for healing and for optimum maintenance of essential body functions. A final very important concept is that of biochemical energy. The goal of the entire body is to produce energy, at least one goal. The biochemical goal is energy production because energy is required for every function, for movement, for thinking, for feeling, for repairing damaged tissue, for regenerating cells, for digestion, and so forth. Therefore, a fundamental goal in metabolic correction is to improve and enhance one's energy levels and to reduce the amount of adaptation required since adaptation uses up energy. Out of these principles come many understandings. For example, we see that there's never a single cause for any disease. Disease is always a multiple cause, multiple effect situation. As a matter of fact, the entire linear concept of cause-effect is actually limited in its usefulness for us because there are always many factors such as diet, emotions, attitudes, nutritional deficiencies, environmental toxins, and other stressors, all of which interact to produce health or disease. It is the interaction of these forces and our ability to understand them and manipulate these forces in a gentle but precise way that determines our state of health and our ability to correct and produce optimum health.